And the idea here is just to state uh, that through time and through space, you have a lot of variability of your carbonate systems. And uh, whatever you are in the, um, uh, on, uh, on, the, on the Earth, if you are in the northern uh, pole, at the equator, or in the southern pole, all of this um, localization will have an influence on the type of carbonates you're going to deposit and, of course, the evolution of these carbonates through, through time. And this is an important point because at some point in, in your process-based modeling, you will need to be thinking about um, the depositional environments uh, and the evolution of your depositional environments which will impact your carbonate systems. So for those of you who are working in oil and gas, uh, carbonate systems represent more than 40% of, uh, of reservoirs for oil and gas resources of the planet. So you have a lot of carbonate systems uh, from the Paleozoic into the Mesozoic and, and, and the Cenozoic, and they have different behavior. And um, one of the main and interests of, of my work and maybe Cedric's work and many other people is to try at some point to try to decipher <laughs> Uh, the evolution of these carbonate systems uh, through time and, and through space and try to understand um, the, the influence of climatic conditions, the influence of structural conditions on the evolution of these, um, uh, of these carbonate systems. Uh, now, of course, um, well, I, I may be repeating some um, um, brief uh, description of carbonates, which might be uh, of skeletal, so biological uh, composition or non-skeletal or chemical origin. And this is a very important point because we can, because bio, uh, biochemistry has an important influence on the generation and, and production of your carbonate systems. And if you don't understand what type of carbonate are you modeling or what type of fauna are you modeling, you will hardly be able to produce a consistent numerical model. So if we look at skeletal, uh, uh, skeletal examples, looking for example at green and red algae, which might have sometimes a completely different behavior than Corallian systems or, or, um, or gastropod deposits, um, and of course, all of these might be influenced also by reworking and, and development of, uh, of some um, uh, of bioclasts and, uh, and dismantling of your platforms and then uh, redeposition of, uh, of these types of uh, clasts or, uh, um, or biologically influenced uh, system from the margin side into, uh, into the slope or even sometimes into the basin side. But also something which is also important is to look at the non-skeletal component of, um, of carbonate, which is mainly influenced by, uh, by chemistry. And, uh, and of course, temperature of water, the salinity of your water might, might have an impact uh, on, uh, and the turbidity of your water might have an impact on, uh, on all of these deposits at some point. So we need to keep in mind that uh, carbonate, sy uh, carbonate systems are influenced by living organisms, but also by chemistry. And, uh, uh, and we'll, we'll discuss at, at some point about the, the Dionysos flow process-based model, but um, these are very, very important uh, input parameters that need to be integrated in, into your model whenever you're looking at carbonate systems. Now, getting you back to, to some nice pictures, also just to show you some of the, the oolitic shoals that you might find also in carbonate systems, but uh, uh, like more restricted atolls or um, reefs and, and lagoons, which, are, which might be very, uh, uh, very influenced by, uh, by wave energy. Uh, the main key message here to take from carbonate system in general is that carbonate systems develop into different types of factories. So you have three main types of factories that we'll be discussing later on, but these factories are influenced by paleogeography, which also will influence the wave action, the use to see, um, production rates, erosion rates, which might have also an important impact on your uh, carbonate uh, geometries and architectures, uh, the wave transport or the gravity transport of your system. And these carbonate have also uh, many geometries. They can uh, generate um, uh, through sequences of aggrading uh, systems or progradations, looking at clinoforms, retrograding systems, uh, more localized buildups or rim platforms, mounted features, shoals, or ramp. So what we aim to do is to try to predict using modeling uh, how is our carbonate factory um, uh, developing through time, but also how is the geometry of carbonates evolving laterally and, and vertically. And this is one of the main challenges that we will all also see. Uh, so all of these are very, very important uh, uh, parameters that make things a bit more uh, complicated when we look at, uh, at modeling, uh, at the modeling of, uh, uh, of these carbonate systems. Uh, so carbonates are also very influenced by, um, by temperature, as we said. So um, usually carbonates are localized in high and low latitudes. Their production rate usually is higher in, uh, in hotter areas, so uh, in, in latitude between uh, 30 degrees north and, and 30 degrees south, with temperature which are usually above, uh, above 20 degrees, and salinities which are relatively ranging between 30 and, and 40 per mil. 
When the temperature drops, usually less than 15 degrees, you have many um, carbonates which will not be able to survive. So maybe your Corellian systems and your green algae will, will not thrive as, um, as they would be in, um, in hotter areas. Uh, so carbonate is very influenced by temperature, so by latitude also, but also different types of carbonates react differently to uh, these types of um, climatic conditions. Uh, they react differently uh, to, the, to the climatic conditions, but also they are existent at different times um, uh, in the geological record. So uh, sometimes uh, I hear people talking about rudest present in, uh, in the Paleozoic, so watch out guys. Uh, uh, maybe you, you have to go back and, and look very closely at um, at the timing on which your, your different fauna has been developing through time. So this is also a very important point because Earth's development uh, will also have um, an impact on uh, on the type of carbonate fauna that you will be developing. So developing Corellian system might be uh, more um, more seen uh, since uh, since the Mesozoic and, and the Cenozoic time. Uh, for example, gastropods are, are much less... Um, uh, prominent in, in the Paleozoic and maybe uh, much more uh, present in, in the Cenozoic and the, and, and, and the present day. Uh, Corellian uh, red algae will mainly strive also at, um, at the end of the Mesozoic and in the Cenozoic time. So all of this information regarding time and space um, and temperature has an important impact on, on your carbonates. Now looking at the different types of carbonate factory and why we understand carbonate factory uh, as, as a key component to, to modeling, is that we need to understand how is our carbonate fauna or how is our carbonate factory behaving uh, through depth. So you will see that uh, tropical factories are mainly producing carbonates uh, in uh, shallow marine systems, so between 0 and 50 meters, let's say you have a very high production rates of carbonates, and then uh, after that you have a, a sharp drop in your carbonate production. Cool water carbonates uh, usually present um, low, relatively lower production rates, but their uh, production is, um, is much more um, extending uh, toward deeper uh, bathymetries or deeper water systems. And then you have your mud mount factory, uh, which is also present at uh, relatively higher uh, production rates, uh, starting from um, 20 to, to, uh, to much deeper uh, systems. And then they will be um, less producing in the, in the, in the shallower systems. Uh, because of uh, the wave energy, because of the, um, the, the high transportability of um, uh, and the, high, the less preservation of these uh, fine grain particles in the very, very shallow marine system. Uh, so this is, uh, this is quite crucial because these types of laws for your uh, carbonate factories will be integrated in your uh, numerical model. So looking at a carbonate factory in the Mesozoic, for example, a tropical carbonate factory around, uh, around the Arabian plate, uh, will have a different behavior than looking uh, at a cool water uh, a factory somewhere else in the world at a different time. So timing is very important, the type also of, um, of carbonate factory, and looking at carbonate production rates. And also this is a very important point and very challenging uh, to try to decipher through time. Uh, if we just take a, a brief uh, uh, comparison between some of the work of Schlager um, has done uh, in ancient carbonates and comparing them to uh, to um, recent carbonates, you can already see that uh, the ancient carbonates are actually uh, presenting much less accumulation rates than um, the carbonates which are um, uh, warm water carbonates or recent carbonates. Uh, you have different types of explanations to that. Remember that in the geological record, you have a lot of erosional surfaces, you also have compaction. And, um, and some calculation of um, carbonate production rates or carbonate accumulation rate or preserved, I'd rather call them preserved accumulation rates, are mainly calculating what we see at the actual days and try to subdivide them by time in order for us and decompact them in order for us to have a better assessment of carbonate production through time. So how to reconstruct carbonate production through time is also a very, very challenging, um, a very challenging perspective in, in the work of numerical modeling. Uh, geologists who are looking at more... Um, uh, at more the scientific domain or the academic domain will be more interested in trying to decipher how carbonates were compacted through time, uh, how much erosion did we have through time. Uh, usually the industry, because of time constraints, they usually go much quicker on, um, on compaction and, and, and trying to understand uh, the, the evolution of your carbonate platform before being compacted and then eroded at some point. So we need to keep in mind that, um, that carbonates are... Um, 
are, are compacting differently. The different types of carbonates will compact differently. Different types of grain sizes will compact differently under different types of uh, overburden. Uh, ancient carbonates will have a different production rates through time than recent carbonates that we currently know. And tropical factory carbonates will also have a different behavior than cool water factories. So already you can see how much diversity you have in terms of uh, uh, in terms of processes which might act on your carbonate uh, on your carbonate system. Also looking at wave energy and uh, and knowing that different types of carbonates also will behave differently with regards to your wave energy. Some carbonates uh, would rather have much more turbidity um, in uh, in the system. Uh, for example, generating oolitic shoals or or generating uh, let's say encrusting coralian algae. Uh, uh, encompass a much higher wave energy system than, for example, looking at, at grazing lawns or looking at uh, much finer lagoonal systems, which, ha which have uh, low, energy, low en wave energy impact on them. And of course, wave energy is, uh, is influenced by the, sometimes by the direction of your wind and thus by uh, the opening and closing of your oceans. So um, understanding the evolution of your, your wave direction and also your wave energy will have an important impact on the geometry of your carbonate platform and also on the facies display. Um, there's a lot, a lot of parameters that should be accounted for. And I know that uh, many of you have been working on carbonates and mainly also on carbonate modeling have, have thought about uh, how to overcome these challenges in terms of um, input parameters of, uh, of um, uh, ecology uh, influencing carbonate systems. So, we talked a lot in the in the previous slides about the variability of um, of ecology and the impact also of structuration on on the potential uh, carbonate developing uh, through time, but an important point um, to highlight is the variability in the position and environments that you will use it, usually see in your carbonate systems. And as we said, these different types of depositional environments will have different different ecological um, influences on them. Uh, so um, let's say a, a very shallow subramarine um, uh, subra system will be um, usually hypersaline, uh, very very uh, uh, intermittently uh, flooded by some water, and then evaporation quite high. So developing some um, some evaporites, like for example in, in Oman. So maybe a lot of you have have, have gone and, and seen the subra uh, development uh, in uh, in Oman area. Looking at sandy shoals or oolitic shoals also will be more influenced by um, wave energy and retransport of your um, carbonate coated grains, for example. You might have some smaller patch reefs which are encrusting in some areas that might have a slightly higher topography in your lagoon, uh, maybe having also some, some algal mounds uh, developing there. Having a big um, barrier reef, for example, that as we as I showed you a bit in, um, in the Australian part, but also uh, around some some of the, the volcanoes along the French Polynesia, uh, you can clearly see these types of extensive um, barrier reefs, which are usually impacted by a lot of uh, relatively high wave energy systems uh, and uh, developing coralian systems um, and, uh, and, and coral reefs, uh, which might be also impacted by tidal channels or, or even fluvial channels if you have any siliciclastic influx coming from the margin side. Carbonates um, don't only develop and settle in place, but they are also retransported, and different types of transport parameters will, will be thought of or should be integrated in, in your modeling perspective. Usually you integrate uh, in your modeling a wave action which will retransport your carbonate systems. Of course, wave might have a bit uh, of uh, importance on the dismantling of your platform, but also sometimes you might have the gravity which might uh, influence a lot on, uh, on these big gravity driven deposits because of the angle of repose of your carbonate platform that might at some point be developing very quickly and steepening very quickly. So you will develop a lot of dismantling and submarine fans, uh, calci turbidites or, uh, or, um, or uh, let's say uh, some, uh, some, uh, some big um, dismantling of your, of your platform along the toe of slope um, facing your four reef, uh, your four year, four reef area. So you see that there's a huge amount of, um, of the positional environments that need to be thought of uh, whenever you're modeling. Sometimes, and depending on your modeling um, perspective or your modeling, uh, let's say, objectives, uh, you will not be looking at all of these um, the positional environments at the same time. Um, some people will be more focused on, uh, on interpreting or modeling sand uh, or uh, oolitic shoaling, for example. Other people will be more focused on a, on a refill area uh, for a specific type of, uh, of prospect. 
sometimes in um, in our work um, at Bayesian scales, we have a look at at a much broader depositional model. So we'll have to look at the different types of depositional environments in, in our same modeling uh, um, grid or um, uh, yeah or model. So if we want to complexify even more things, I'm, uh, and <laughs> the idea here is, uh, is is to highlight a lot the, the the challenges and how can we answer to these challenges is sequence stratigraphy. And uh, depending on the hierarchy or the sequence stratigraphic order that you that you're willing to to look at, uh, the different processes uh, influencing your carbon system will be different. Looking at the first order um, a sequence which has a uh, more than a 50 million year duration. Well, the main uh, influencing uh, process is, of course, long-term global tectonics, and uh, and the effects, of course, will having an impact on atmospheric CO2, for example, ice or greenhouse, volume of uh, mid-ocean ridges, sea level changes at at a very big, um, at a very uh, at a very large uh, order, let's say. And then, if you're looking at a, at a much uh, more local tectonism, or even looking at more climatic conditions, so you'll be looking at the third or fourth order. Here, you'll have to integrate much uh, much more processes into your system. If you have any faulting, if you have any uplift, if you have any uh, subduction at some point, you'll have to um, to integrate all of these structure or local tectonic information on uh, in your uh, in your modeling. And the effect will be, of course, a direct effect on sea level, on your base level changes, on your sediment supply, which is very important because we know that carbonate systems might be influenced by silicic elastics, which might be provided by an uplifted area, for example, in the nearby uh, in the nearby domain, or also looking at uh, longer term climatic changes. Uh, but if you want to zoom in into uh, understanding Milankovitch cycles at um, at a very smaller uh, scale. Uh, you'll be looking at fourth or fifth scale, looking at the orbital control and how will this impact your carbonate systems. What about rainfall? Uh, of course, your temperature gradients, your wind uh, variability, and your sea level changes. So this is in terms of stratigraphic hierarchy. So before modeling or before getting into a numerical model, these and these questions need to be answered um, at point because a lot of time uh, we had we deal with people who want to model. But the question is, what are you going to model and what's the objective of your model? Are you really aiming to answer a question related to the impact of a Milankovitch cycle on your facies? Or are you looking at the impact of a structuration, which is more regional structuration on your um, turbidite, uh, for example, system? So all of these um, questions need to be really um, integrated in the, in the scientific uh, discussion and the scientific exchanges prior to modeling themselves. Um, and then you'll be going to uh, understanding the control on your sedimentary record. So we talked a bit about Milankovitch cycles. We have to look also at sea level variation. Are you looking at a large scale, low frequency, or are you looking at a high frequency sea level changes? What are you trying to depict through your modeling? Uh, are, you, are you willing to depict 100,000 years variability, or are you trying to depict millions of years variability and, and overall uh, development of your, uh, your sequence setting? I will not bore you with many other uh, uh, different, uh, let's say, uh, structural or, or even ecological parameters that we, we have to integrate. But keep in mind that all of these um, impacting parameters on carbonates needs to be taken into account when when you go from um, from a conceptual geological model into a more numerical model. So, of course, geometry is an important. Um, is a very important aspect uh, when you're when you're willing to look at carbonates, and um, and sequence stratigraphy and the different types of um, uh, and different types of settings under which your carbonate is being developed uh, will um, influence facies, and uh, of course will thus influence your reservoir characteristics or your petroleum system elements characteristics at some point. If you have a much more terrigenous clastic system, you will see that your carbonates will not be uh, developing very intensively on your margin side, but also uh, in your deeper system. But the more you're going into uh, humid, lime, for example, ecologically um, influenced accommodation or even physic physically influenced accommodation, and then later carbonates and evaporite, you will see that you will have and you will generate a lot, a lot of different types of carbonate geometries, going from aggradation to progradations, uh, from differentiation of reefs and shoal and a, and a back shoal or a lagoonal system, and, and maybe also looking at exposed areas with some evaporite developing on them. The aim through the slide is just to, to highlight the, the need 
for you to understand the variability at least at an overall scale of your carbonate geometry. And this is usually seen through the seismic data, if you have relatively good quality seismic data. Of course, having an idea of the different types of facies display with regards to your well data or your um, uh, if you have any um, any seismic uh, or any borehole imaging that you can um, that you can use looking at biostratigraphy will be a very very important point for you to be able to correlate between your different sequences uh, and of course your sea level changes what type of sea level curve are you using are you using a regional sea level curve are you using a more local sea level curve and this will have an important impact on the resolution of your model and the resolution of the geometries that you're willing to uh, to tackle through uh, through numerical uh, process based modeling um, okay so now the Sorry, the question will be, how do we go from a conceptual model where we have all of this backload of information in, in carbonate systems and the influencing ecology and structure on them to a numerical application? So there's a lot of numerical models which are used usually in the, in the exploration and production chain in, in hydrocarbon um, exploration. And you have different techniques and different approaches. Some people use um, more geostatistical approaches. Some other people use uh, fuzzy, ru fuzzy rules. Uh, other people use process-based approaches. But you need to understand the link between a conceptual model, which is developed uh, by a geologist or by a geoscientist who has been looking at seismic data, been looking at petrophysical data, at well data, at seismic characterization, describing diagenesis, and then developing a depositional conceptual model. And I'll focus a lot on the term conceptual model because this is a concept that different geologists will produce. So having two geologists together will rarely um, uh, find out a single conceptual model. So there's a lot of different conceptual models depending on the data that you have and depending also on the a priori that the geophysicist or the geologist has with regards to the evolution of their platform. So what is the link between a conceptual geological model and testing a numerical model? So we're going from what we see on well data, what we see on seismic data, into numbers, into physics. And many people sometimes forget uh, about the importance of analog models and lab modeling. So for, for people who are not very aware of forward stratigraphic modeling and how has this been developing through time, uh, the work that has been conducted by IFP and many, many other uh, uh, renowned um, scientific institutions in, uh, in, the, in the UK and in, in Germany and, uh, and, and Holland have focused a lot on understanding how does carbonate develop in labs? Uh, how do we develop and what are the influence, for example, of having a, a, a CO2-rich water, so an acidic water on some refill systems? Um, what are the production rates that we can develop and how do we track the production rates of current day carbonates? All of these um, types of um, assessments and scientific uh, work has been mainly focused on trying to generate rules and mathematical laws and physical laws that are later implemented in, in forward models or in process-based process models. So that sometimes there's a lot of answers that the industry will have to go uh, look for in the scientific uh, publications and, and the big, big scientific um, record that uh, Schlager, uh, Pete Burgess, yourself uh, also, uh, Cedric, and many, many other people working on carbonates have been looking for and trying to decipher along the years. In order for us at some point to get into a more numerical based model. And here, in the case of the model that we will be describing today, which is the Dionysos flow code, um, uh, and looking at much more process-based forward stratigraphic model, we will be focusing a lot on, on input parameters and what can we use from the scientific realm and what can we use even from the industrial realm to try to de-risk as much as possible our carbonate facies, textures, but also trying to look at diagenesis at some point, and this maybe will be a very important discussion in the, in the future. So data resolution, modeling um, uh, is, is also, other than being influenced by the whole process of sedimentation and uh, the process of, uh, of development of your, your earth structure, is also, is also influenced by uh, your data resolution. So what type of data do you have that will allow you to model? And how far can you go with your modeling uh, with a certainty? You have different types of data resolution going from lower uh, lower data resolution gravity magnetics into 2D seismics, 3D seismics, but also looking at a much higher data resolution. So really, 
one of the also main challenges here will be more focused on data and trying to understand um, how can you make sense of all of your data. A well or a sin section is a very localized um, resolution or a very localized data point that will be used um, by some geologists, for example, looking at a really, really fine uh, reservoir uh, scale um, model. Uh, but unfortunately, uh, sin sections or cores or cuttings uh, are not always available in um, in some places in the world when where oil and gas companies are uh, are going to uh, to try to tackle and discover uh, accumulation in uh, in carbonate systems. So they they will be more sticking to two D two D seismics or three D seismics and trying to integrate petrophysics and generate um, seismic characterization and try to predict or map uh, different types of facies laterally and vertically. So scaling is very important in terms of data and then how to model. Uh, with case. So what, what to choose when, you, when you're modeling? Of course, in our case, we'll be looking at more modeling a basin scale or a res reservoir field scale um, in using forward stratigraphic models, but you should not forget that uh, on, a much, uh, on a much larger scale, uh, impact of, for example, um, subduction zones uh, that are usually driven by, by lithospheric models or modeled by lithospheric models or um, or multi uh, multi scale uh, basin uh, basin models have an important influence on on your geological conceptual model. So uh, sometimes we go back to uh, to the the publications, or sometimes we also go back to try to understand how is the structural evolution at the plate scale has a, has an impact on um, maybe a more local carbonate system. So scaling in terms of data, but also scaling in terms of modeling will have an important important point on. Um, how far can you go with trying to depict geometries of carbonates? How far can you understand carbonate evolution through time? And sometimes how much can you assess external uh, influencing parameters on your carbonate system, which might you might not necessarily see uh, on your well on your well data or on your on your thick thin section itself. So Dionysos flow for carbonate, uh, for those who are not very uh, familiar with forward stratigraphic modeling, usually uh, we use uh, forward modeling to try to reproduce the evolution of, uh, of sequence stratigraphy through time. Uh, we want to uh, understand the evolution of uh, sea level, salinity, uh, water turbidity, floor composition, uh, dissolution and exposure timing um, through time, and by that, uh, trying to depict geometries of, uh, of our carbonate system. Uh, I will not bore you with the, the fusion equation that we usually use and the, the laws that we usually use in, uh, in Dionysos flow. There's a lot of publications that you can check. But just um, just to point out quickly to the, to the influence of, uh, of the diffusion equation. Um, so you have a production rate in case of carbonates or a sediment load in case of silicic plastics, which is mainly influenced by uh, a production reference, so uh, by time, and a bathymetry. So uh, how is your bathymetry changing through time and what's the influence of your bathymetry on your carbonate production rate? So this is why I tell you carbonate factory production laws are very important when, uh, to, to be integrated in our uh, numerical model. We also have the wave uh, influence, which will play a role uh, into your equation. And then you'll have an ecology. And uh, when you look at your ecology, uh, here we talk about temperature, we talk about salinity, we talk about seafloor, we might also talk about dif distance to shore that you can calculate. Uh, you can also try to add turbidity of water. All of these can be integrated into, um, into the forward stratigraphic model. And at some point here, you can clearly see some, an example of small bioconstruction developing uh, at the crustal front of, uh, of some of the progradation of your, uh, of your system, maybe also developing some more localized uh, reefs. So we integrate ecology, we integrate structure, so subsidence, we integrate bathymetry, sea level changes, wave energy, and production rate for us to understand how is our carbonate uh, platform developing. And there's a lot of rules that, uh, that you can check into the Dionysos model at some point. But also something which is very important in carbonates is that sometimes, uh, and most of the times, uh, it, it comes in uh, coincidence also with developing of evaporite. So how do we use evaporite in the modeling also uh, using Dionysos? Back in the days, um, this was not integrated in, um, uh, in, in forward stratigraphic modeling. So we have now generated uh, new laws to develop evaporite. So we use evaporation and precipitation rates. Uh, and also we can use um, curves of salinity development through time to be able to understand what we call a hydric balance. 
So how much water do you have into your system and how much concentration of salinity you have into your water to be able to develop evaporite. And different types of evaporite, of course, will, will develop at um, different types of salinity trenches or salinity constraint level. Uh, gypsum will um, maybe develop at a salinity uh, which is uh, less than halite into your system. And of course, carbonates will develop with relatively lower salinities. So you can integrate evaporite modeling um, of course, this, still, this is still a basic evaporite modeling. Uh, this is not a, uh, a chemical model. It's, uh, it's just trying to represent evaporite by using evaporation and precipitation uh, rates. And of course, concentration of salt into your water. So many people will ask, uh, how can you understand the evolution of uh, evaporation and precipitation through time? So this is also another challenge that we have been testing in the past years. So there's been a lot of work by Selwood and Valdez, and um, some of you guys who have been looking at this uh, know a bit what I'm talking about. Um, uh, Selwood and Valdez have been working a lot on trying to develop what we what they call general circulation models. So trying to understand how um, uh, Earth has been developing through time and, and um, the current circulation of uh, ocean current circulation and what is the influence of these ocean current circulations and temperature on uh, the development of your different seasonal precipitation and the precipitation rate and evaporation rate through time. So they were able to predict through past times through the Mesozoic and this is an example of the Jurassic and, and the Triassic how uh, much precipitation did you have at uh, different types of uh, periods and uh, at different also times of, of latitudes that you have. So you can make use of these types of general circulation models, of course, when you look at a larger scale, to try to constrain your minimum and maximum precipitation ranges. Something else what also uh, geologists or, or scientists are looking at are um, annual evaporation rates at current days. So tra trying to track the last 50 years or 100 years of, um, of evaporation. So there's a lot of work compiled in, um, in World Ocean Atlas on, on temperature and salinity that you can uh, use uh, to try to represent or try to constrain, if you want, your forward stratigraphic model or your process-based model at some point. So making use of these types of ocean property components uh, are, uh, are crucial why you want to model evaporite, but also carbonate, um, different carbonate types. Remember, some uh, some carbonate fauna is more um, uh, sensitive to uh, to salinity, so um, salinity and temperature can, can have an important impact on the development of these of this fauna. So sediment transport, also of course, your carbonate will be developing, but will not be settling only in place. There will be transport. So we use uh, low energy, long term flow. So in case you have uh, an influence of, uh, of any fluvial system coming in into your, um, into your area, but also we can use high energy flows, which usually reflect turbidite system or hyperpycnides. Uh, hyper uh, but you also have catastrophic flows, which are usually influenced by the angle of repose of your carbonate platform and then the dismantling of your platform. And of course, the influence of wave energy into your system. So you have wave energy, you have gravity driven deposits, but also you have fluvial deposits coming on a, on a longer thing term. And the aim here is to represent erosion uh, and how is uh, sediments are, how are sediments deposited and being eroded and then transported at some point into the basin. Uh, Pete Burgess has done a lot of work. I will not uh, repeat his work. There's a lot of work uh, and published work uh, uh, done. And the, the main aim here is to focus on carbonate diffusion. So uh, different types of carbonate grains, so grain size is, is also crucial in modeling, will have a different influence on how your geometry or how the platform um, is developing. Some homoclinal ramps will have a different behavior in terms of production rate, but also in terms of diffusion than, for example, very steep uh, clinoform uh, or prograding geometries that you might see at, um, in, in, some, in some parts. The more you will see a steep geometry or a steep clinoform, the less your system will be diffusing, and thus you might have much higher production rates um, and usually much coarser grains. So coarser grain have a higher density. Usually, the um, cementation will also plays an, an important role, and this is an, another another parameter which is difficult to assess um, in uh, in numerical modeling. But note that we use diffusion in such type of uh, process based system to try to represent geometries, and we calibrate the geometries that we see into the seismic to the geometries of our model. And I'll show you some example in the next steps. And you can see that, uh, for, for example, a very gentle homoclinal ramp, usually the diffusion coefficients are much higher 
because uh, you will be transporting more gently on uh, on your ramp compared to the fusion coefficients, which are much smaller um, in uh, prograding uh, geometry, uh, where transport is much more difficult because of uh, particle size um, and also because of very quick carbonate production rates that are developing. So what is the workflow? How do we generate um, a forest stratigraphic model? Uh, a forest stratigraphic model is not a data-bound model. What I mean by data-bound model is it's not like the static model that you usually use in, uh, in geostatistics as inputting wells, inputting seismic, and then populating out of these wells uh, facies. In forest stratigraphic model, we, such as of Dionysus flow, we use the diffusion equation that I, that I showed you before. So we use data and we try to integrate out of this data input parameters. The input parameters are subsidence maps, are paleobathymetric evolution, are sedimentary types or sedimentary grain sizes, entry points in case you have silicic classic systems, or carbonate types. And we don't populate geostatistically. We populate using the diffusion equation and using the stratigraphic um, concept of accommodation space, uh, subsidence, eustatic sea level changes, and carbonate production rates. And then we have different processes. So we integrate processes in our diffusion equation. Are we uh, driving uh, slope deposits? Are we looking at wave action? Are we looking at water transport by a fluvial system? Are we looking at eustatic sea level changes? What type of erosion rates do we have? The diffusion? ecological factors and carbonate factories developing through time. And at the end of the day, we generate this conceptual model that we test, and then we calibrate at the end our model to our data. So data, hard data as well, and seismic is only used to generate input. The input will be process, will be integrated in the forward model, will be integrating processes in our carbonate system, and then we'll be recalibrating the output of our model to our data. So we will be comparing our model to the 1D data, wells, for example, 2D data, seismic section, 3D data, for example, any um, uh, seismic characterization that might, uh, seismic characterization map that, that we might use. And finally, you go into again into this loop to try to simulate and calibrate again. So this is always a loop between testing a process and then comparing your results to your data. And remember, well, you will not have 100% calibration because this is not a data-bound model. It's not a geostatistical model. I'll be quickly taking you to some uh, case studies. This is an example that we've done for Kuwait. Um, everything that this is this was a very uh, a very large scale uh, basin scale model. Um, cell size is five kilometers by five kilometers. Time step 500,000 years. Time steps with about 20 wells. Um, everything that you will see here in uh, darker blue represent deep water carbonates. The yellow here represent shoaling, and everything in orange here represent siliciclastic systems, which are coming into uh, into the, the lower Cretaceous carbonates. So you can see that uh, a model presented by a geologist will also be potentially be modeled by um, by us numerical modelers using all types of constraints. The different types of constraints. I will not take you back again into all these constraints, but our paleogeography geological model, understanding the static sea level curve, understanding by stratigraphy and age dating. So if you want to model a shoal, for example, you will have to integrate shallow turbidity, so bathymetries which are shallow. You'll have to integrate wave energy, and you can see uh, some of the wave energy calculated into our model. So a direction of wave and an energy or wave base. And then also looking at the influence of bathymetry wave on your carbonate content. So once you integrate all of these models from bathymetry to wave energy and carbonate content, you'll be able to generate what we call a facies model. For example, the facies model here is showing you in yellow uh, oolithic shoals developing quite largely in the southern part of Kuwait, while you have much more patchy shoals developing in the northern part. In, in between these shoals, you might have some relatively deeper embayments or open marine systems uh, developing towards the, the eastern part of our setting. What I, why am I uh, showing you the different types of model? Because all of this ecological parameter will have to play a role on your uh, on your facies, and the facies will play also a very important role on your uh, petroleum system elements that you will see through time. The advantage of looking at um, or using a uh, forest stratigraphic model is that you're really modeling stratigraphy. So you're modeling through time and you're understanding the evolution, for example, of your sea level on the different types of geometries that you see. 
This is a small example showing you the influence of sea level changes on the geometries that you see. Everything in white and light uh, blue represents shallow marine carbonates, and everything in deep blue represents deep water carbonates. You can see the impact of wave energy on the margin side and the influence of coarser grain carbonates or shoals on, um, on these systems. This is an example of how your system is being evolving through time, and time is a very important component whenever you're looking at numerical models. And then later on, of course, trying to look and compare some of the well data to the geometries that you can see into, into your model. There's a lot of things published already and a lot of things which are very confidential, so don't hesitate to go back to, uh, to our publications. Something important also that needs to be um, discussed is the mixed siliciclastic and carbonate systems. So we already know that uh, some carbonate systems are influenced by siliciclastics, uh, siliciclastic component. And uh, the siliciclastic component will generate much more turbidity in the water, will, will, will hinder your light getting into your carbonate platform, will bring much more muddy uh, uh, or plastics or sandy component into your carbonate system, which will have um, a negative um, effect on the development of your carbonate systems. This is an example from, uh, from also from Kuwait. Uh, showing you a lower Cretaceous carbonate, so everything here in light blue uh, and uh, and pink will represent carbonate systems, and everything in, in reddish and yellow represent fluvial deltaic systems getting into uh, the carbonate. Uh, lito, uh, in this case, was a, a lithocodium bacinella uh, a platform, and you see that through time your carbonate system system is shifting away from uh, your fluvial and it's and be, uh, from your, from your fluvial system is being driven away away, um, and then at some point will be uh, killed by your uh, siliciclastic influx. So, integrating siliciclastic is doable. Generating mixed siliciclastic and carbonate system also is very important because it will allow you to understand um, seal versus reservoirs or even the quality of your reservoir, which might not be very attractive in, uh, in this case. Now, I'm taking you to another level, which is a much more uh, focused uh, reservoir scale uh, carbonate system. Here we're looking at the Shwaiba formation in, uh, in Abu Dhabi, uh, just to show you different types of geometries that have been into, uh, interpreted by, by Drost and by, uh, by Jose, uh, showing you some aggradation and then prograding to aggrading system and then big clinoforms um, developing into um, the low stand and high stand phases towards the, the Aptian 4 and Aptian 5, uh, towards the Bab Basin at this point. A lot of work has been done by um, Al-Wazir and Atko trying to um, depict the geometries, but also try to look at the facies development uh, on these carbonate platforms. Everything you see here in green shows you Lithocodium bacinella mounds developing on uh, gently uh, homoclinal ramps with aggrading systems. And then you can see the influx of rudest patches. So everything in orange here and red will represent rudest shoals and, and rudest platforms, which will be later on prograding. And you can see these rudest and some bioconstruction developing at the crest of the clinoforms, and then the more you're getting deeper into the system, the more you're getting into a more muddy um, or a waxstone, mudstone uh, component or texture. And the aim was to try to model this type of um, geometries using process base. Uh, ATCO at this point were trying to model using um, geostatistical approaches, but they were having a lot of difficulties trying to understand and trying to reproduce these type of geometries and also the impact of sea level changes on smaller, relatively smaller geometries, which will be baffled to flow, but also sometimes uh, enhancing flow uh, facies that they were not able to model geostatistically. What, uh, what we have done here was a model of 20 kilometers by 40 kilometers. So this is a much smaller scale than the 300 kilometers by 200 uh, that we showed you earlier on, uh, in Kuwait. Uh, cell sizes are also much smaller. We're looking at 200 meters by 200 meters, and we had much, much more uh, calibration. Uh, here we calibrated to 20 cores, but we tested hundreds and hundreds of blind tests to make sure that the, the model is a consistent model. And what, what you can clearly see in, uh, in this model is the variability in geometries that we are able to gather. For example, going from patchy algal mounds, Lithocodium bacinella mounds, uh, into the coalescence of these mounds into platforms, floatstone and um, floatstone dominated and, and grainstone dominated platforms, and then developing development of a much deeper system in, towards the, the Bab Basin itself. And then what's really interesting also in using process-based models, and because you're using ecology a lot, is the variability that you might have laterally uh, and also vertically. You can see here you have a big, uh, for example, barrier, 
and then at the back you have more uh, ponds um, of uh, mudstone ponds in a, in a lagoonal setting, but also you can develop these small shoals. And um, this is very difficult to track. Stratigraphic trapping mechanisms are really difficult to track whenever you're generating geostatistical models or just uh, geostatistically data-bound models. You can also see these prograding geometries that we were able to model with uh, much higher energies and, and bound stone and float stone at the crest of the clinoforms that you have. This is an example of my model in texture, but also my models in, in, in facies. I'm more prone to developing firstly a model in, uh, in lithology texture and then combining different types of textures and environmental parameter to try to generate facies associations. And you can compare my facies associations to the model proposed by uh, the geoscientists. And this is, is quite interesting because we are able to depict uh, much more variability into our model at the scale of, uh, of, of the reservoir than we would have been doing so with, uh, with just a small, simple geostatistical model. So now I'm getting to the last part of the, the presentation. Uh, I might have taken a bit more time than, than expected, but to show you that sensitivity is a very important parameter and a very important um, uh, perspective, let's say, to uh, using numerical models. There is no single model which is correct. So uh, we've worked a lot with Cedric and, and many other people on trying to use sensitivity. We can use sensitivity on initial paleobathymetry, try to understand how the initial paleobathymetry has influenced the geometry of our system. We can also look at eustatic sea level curves, looking at different frequency eustatic sea level curves and understanding uh, the different types of carbonate grain um, evolution through time. And you can see that, for example, a high frequency curve will provide you much more information on a reservoir scale than a longer term curve. Looking at also wave base tests. So if you have a high wave base and a high wave energy system, sometimes you'll be generating much more um, you'll be more prone to generating uh, clinoform progradations and um, carbonate prone uh, systems which are uh, which are uh, really, uh, let's say, um, favored by higher energy systems, like for example, Corellian systems. Uh, all of these uh, parameters uh, have now been integrated also um, into what we call uh, automated uh, numerical models or automated multi-realizations. At first, we used to do these simple uh, simulations by hand. So we used to change the parameters by hand, putting minimum and maximum values. But now we have been developing uh, what we call an automated sensitivity analysis workflow. So we use Cougar Flow, which is a multi-simulator. Minimum and maximum values for all the uncertainty parameters. They can be wave energy, they can be bathymetry, they can be carbonate production rates, they can also be eustatic sea level curves. We integrate them in what we call a Latin hypercube um, experimental design. And when, then we generate hundreds and thousands of simulations in a couple of hours. And we, once we have these types of models, so we'll have a thousand model instead of having just one model, we can look at the sensitivity of the different types of parameter. Which parameter would be more sensitive on our carbonate production? And this for the scientific community is very, is very interesting at some point. Once we understand which are the parameters that might be the ha that might have the highest influence? We can use them uh, in second runs of, of simulations to try to depict even more the behavior of these systems on on our model, and try to look at a very high calibration between the well data and between our forest stratigraphic model, and try to understand in in these zones how will be uh, um, our model or how will be our carbonate platform behaving. For example, if we look at the down left part, you'll see a reference case model, which is mainly model in, in, in yellow, and you have carbonate uh, grain stones and, and pack stones in green, and everything in blue will be mud stones. And you can see that other plausible models will show you that around this area here, which is of higher energy, you might be developing a bit more bound stone, which might be at some point maybe more porous. So for, for, the, for the industry and for the oil and gas, um, de-risking of petroleum system elements using multi-simulations and multi-realization and sensitivity analysis is a very on-point on um, uh, process that is being used currently uh, with the industry. So uh, out of them, you can generate, of course, uh, sensitivity maps. And sensitivity maps will give you an idea, or risk maps will give you an idea of where are the zones where even if you change your different input parameters within the range that you set, you will not have an impact on your facies or on your thickness. For example, in this area here, changing, um, let's say, uh, energy will not have an influence in this area, but will have much more influence in this 
zone here where you have maybe a, a much steeper uh, glinoform in terms of thickness, but also in terms of texture. You can see that in this area here, you might have much more variability in your texture. So we'll go from a grainstone into a boundstone. So apprehending risk is very important in, uh, uh, in the new workflows that, uh, that we are using uh, at this point. Uh, finally, I, I want to discuss a bit about evaporite and diagenesis, and this will be an open discussion with you guys. Uh, will be, of course, we talked about forest stratigraphic modeling. We talked about the, the wide input parameters that we use. But what we want to look at is how can we use uh, forest stratigraphic modeling and try to get things out of uh, evaporite, but also diagenesis. And because we know that this is a, a, not a, uh, a chemical model or a, or a reactive model, uh, we need to use um, bathymetry. We need to use the salinity calculation that you have out of our model. We need to use lithology, but also sedimentation rate and residence time to try to generate what we call, uh, I would say, qualitative or semi-quantitative uh, dolomite maps or cartification maps. And this has been lately applied a lot um, in Abu Dhabi, but also uh, I applied it on, on Mexico. So we use to integrate all of the process-based results into comparing them with uh, diagenesis and trying to get out some laws or some uh, qualitative assessment of diagenesis. Now what is currently being developed in IFP is uh, much more focused on water tables and we will have hopefully by the end of next year uh, a model which will take much more into account the diagenetic calculation using water tables and using much more um, chemically uh, chemical equations into the into the system. So finally why do we need all of this? Why do we need to integrate between uh, process-based and geostatistical model is to generate what we call hybrid models. Hybrid models are models which will take into account the multiple realization done on forest stratigraphic model, so generation of a hundred or thousands of simulations, and then using the thousands of simulations to inject them at some point into our reservoir model. Our reservoir model is a geostatistical model. We will have a geostatistical model which is constrained to our well data, but also constrained to the tendency of our facies probability cubes generated from a process-based model. So we will have this dual calibration on wells and also a calibration on tendencies of probability of facies or probability of texture into the system. And this is being used uh, by, uh, by reservoir modelers at, uh, uh, as, we, as we speak to try to bring much more geology into the reservoir models, uh, mainly in, uh, in carbonate systems. And also you can, of course, look at probability maps and, and all of what we've discussed later on. So finally, integrating data at different scales, having a conceptual model which we want to test, having ranges of parameters which we want to integrate into forest stratigraphic model will have an important influence on how we generate numerical models. By generating numerical models at a basin scale, we will be able to inject them into what we call basin models or petroleum system models, which will test hydrocarbon flow, and then at the end of the day, by integrating stratigraphic modeling, basin modeling, and GNG data, we will be having a much more confidence on our de-risking of, uh, of our carbonate systems. And then zooming onto the de-risking, and this is the, the, final, the, the final slide that we have, is looking at more geologically oriented reservoir models. Why do we use forward modeling, or why do we use process-based modeling integrated with geostatistics? Is to have the geological component that sometimes we miss by using only geostatistics, and sometimes we miss by only just looking at, at well data and not being able to uh, compare our, our carbonate platform to the seismic data, to the seismic characterization, but also to scientific work which has been conducted earlier. I know that there's a lot of information Maybe uh, you can get back to, uh, to our articles, but I try to resume it in, uh, as much as possible. I hope I wasn't um, too, uh, too quickly speaking. Thank you very much. I'll end up with uh, a nice picture of uh, the Tetiora Atoll and, uh, and the French Polynesia. And uh, if you have any questions, and I know there might be a lot of questions, hopefully uh, I can answer to all of them. Thank you very much. All right, thank you. Um... Thank you very much, uh, Nicola. This this was an uh, an excellent presentation. I really really enjoyed it. And there are questions, so just as a reminder, you can type your question in the uh, in the chat or you can raise your hand. I know people have done a bit of both, so I'll try. I'll start first with uh, Nadine Bierman. She was the first one to have a question for you. I don't know, Nadine, if you want to ask a question yourself, just 
feel free to turn on your microphone and your um, and your video. Otherwise, I'll ask the question. Hello. Hi. Hi. Can you hear me, Nicola? Yes, I hear you well. Yeah. Very good. Uh, thank you very much for the excellent presentation. Um, so my question is, um, how about a GPM for carbonates? Um, does it make carbonate modeling more accurate than FSM? Well, um, when you say G when you say GPM, the question would be I will I will uh, <laughs> I will ask you the question when you when you refer to GPM, do you refer to GPM as the Schlumberger uh, geoprocess modeling? Yes, this is the one that I have seen. Yes. Yes. So the the model of uh, of GPM um, takes into account well what they claim is to take they take into account the Navier-Stokes equation. In, uh, in the Dionysus model, you're, more, you're using the diffusion equation. The Navier-Stokes equation will give you, if you want a bit more um, importance on uh, fluid uh, to particle or particle to particle influence uh, and calculations in, into that. So at a smaller scale, um, uh, the Navier-Stokes equation will help you to try to understand uh, the much refined, if you want, uh, uh, carbonate system at a, at, a much more, at a much smaller scale. But the question will be, um, at this point is how how are you upscaling because you have to be very careful when using the Navier-Stokes equation or when using uh, equations which uh, which try to take um, physics or uh, fluid to fluid or fluid to particle or particle to particle interaction how is the upscaling going uh, going to occur uh, it's not about one being better than the other it's just a different taking into account a different perspective of modeling um, in the perspective of modeling of the forward stratigraphic modeling, you have your diffusion equation and you have all the carbonate production laws that we use. And mm -hmm. it's the same also for GPM. But in the GPM one, uh, there will be the Navier-Stokes equation where you will put more weight a bit on uh, how does particle, you know, friction between particles and liquid and particles uh, behave. So, okay, so we can say something like GPM is good if we're looking at like a refined scale. But if we're looking at like basin scale or like large scale models, and then maybe for a stratigraphic will be more make more sense. Something uh, like that. I think I think both of, I think both of them are good for reservoir scale. It just it depends on uh, the approach you're following for your reservoir scale. Are you really looking at something which is very very thin and trying to understand very slight behavior, which might be Im impacted by your uh, your transport of particles themselves, and that. Well, the Navier-Stokes equation might have an, an important influence on, or are you looking at a reservoir model where you have 50 meters by 50 meter cell sizes? Yeah. So uh, this this will be uh, this will be the question that you will have to you will have to figure out when when you want to model. All right, thanks. I think we'll move to the next uh, question. Yeah. Abdullah Al Ghbali had a question. Do you want to ask it, Abdullah, or you want me to read it? Also, there's there's something uh, there's something maybe uh, worthwhile noting is um, is that uh, I'm not sure if um, if GPM or any other um, uh, you know software uh, use uh, extensive compaction curves and uh, because there's a lot of uh, if you want for example evaporation this cannot be modeled or, or um, a source rock also cannot be modeled so you need to really take into account what are you modeling and uh, what is the software between bracket providing you with. Uh, so need to be, yeah, need to be. So Nicola, I'll just ask Abdullah's question if you don't mind. He, he basically wants to know if you know of any open source software or Python packages that can be used to implement forward stratigraphic modeling. Uh, open sources, uh, as um, well, I don't know if, if Set Sim was <laughs> was an open source uh, platform, but. Uh, if you have uh, some, if you want something which is really integrated like this, uh, I think um, it's not that simple to find uh, uh, an integrated open source platform. I think it's fair to say that if you're an academic, the uh, the basic license is very generous. For free. It's for free. Uh, it's a, it's a free. I it's a free license. This way because I didn't want to put you, but yes, indeed, it is for free. So for academics, you know, working with uh, basic is is not really uh, a, there's no cost barrier to to that. Um, okay, so the next question, I, I'm pretty sure the next participant was uh, Koran. You had your um, your uh, hand raised, so if you want to ask your question. Sure, absolutely. Can you guys hear me? We yes. can hear you, yeah. Excellent. Nicholas, this was a great presentation. Thank you very much. Every time I, I listen to your talks, I really enjoy it. And I have, I have three questions. They're all short. 
but I want to ask you something that I recently learned, like from this pr presentation, automated sensitivity analysis. And this is this is very interesting and it seems very, very useful. Is this only for carbonates or also no. applied no. Silicic it's for carbonates and silicic elastics, and you can use almost all the input parameters that you use as uh, uncertain parameters. Mm -hmm. okay, so, but, but you say uh, we can use maximum and minimum data, and even for bathymetry, how yes. are we going to create that minimum and maximum? Yes. Excellent. So the, the multi-simulations uh, work in three levels. Uh, you can add maps, you can add curves, and also you can add 1D data or scalar data, okay? So for example, you can add one bathymetric map that you like and you want to test and another range of another bathymetric map that you want to test. And then the model or the, the simulator will uh, provide you, depending on the experimental design that you want to do, will provide you with different types of intermediate maps to test. That's and then it's up to you to be able to, uh, this, depending on what type of um, experimental design you want to use, to try to generate simulations and see which one is the best calibrated or which one is the most plausible with your uh, resolution. Okay, I will definitely try. My next question is, uh, you said there is no way to 100% calibrate your, yes. your model, which I understand that. So yes. when do you consider your model is Excellent. to realistic values? Excellent, excellent question, excellent question. So in terms of calibration, uh, I would firstly go for, I, I would say three main points. First of all, your calibration should be taking into account your overall architecture and geometry. So you cannot, you cannot just say uh, I'm having a very good calibration of, on 1D in terms of facies and having a very bad 3D calibration. Okay, so I'll be looking at architecture, at overall geometry. This can be generated through thickness maps. Usually, depending on the resolution of your seismic data, here you might have an interesting uh, approach to uh, how to assess your calibration. If your seismic data, and, and I, I, I usually do it a lot in, uh, um, when, when I work, I look at the, the vertical resolution of my seismic data. Okay. So uh, looking at the vertical resolution of seismic data will give you an idea of how far can you go with your calibration, at least for the overall geometry. So this will be one. Vertical resolution, seismic data for overall architecture. Then number two, I will be looking at 2D seismic lines. What is really nice now in Dionysos is that you can transfer, you can transform your cube which you simulated into a segui, so into a seismic data. So we go from a, a property cube yeah. into a segui, into a seismic data. And then you can compare directly your seismic data or your seismic section mm -hmm. in terms of architecture to a, a proper seismic line. And here you will be able to calibrate on a 2D perspective. And then looking at in 1D, looking at facies and looking at textures. Here you can also extract your um, well data and compare them to your model. You have qualitative and quantitative. So you, what, what you do, you can do a visual calibration, but also you can do a quantitative calibration. So now for the question of how much percent is good and how much percent is not good, this will depend on your data. If your data and your model is upscaled, you need to understand the how much upscaling did you do. You cannot compare, if, you, if your model is, um, let's say if every cell size vertically is 10 meters, and your uh, and your model is and your well data is picking up uh, one centimeter or one millimeter changes. You'll have to see how are you going to upscale your well, firstly to be preserving the sequence stratigraphy, and then how do you compare your upscaled well to your model? And I see sometimes a lot of people comparing super high resolution data to upscaled models and trying to get out a percent of calibration. And this is sometimes very tricky because uh, you might be uh, gathering or picking up some data which uh, is actually not picked up neither by your uh, resolution of your, your, um, your model, neither by the resolution of your data set itself. Because remember, if you use a, a eustatic sea level curve at a high frequency, the high frequency is, uh, I don't know, maybe 100,000 years, 20,000 years or 5,000 years. But uh, sometimes uh, some small events are much finer than that. So you have to be very careful on, on this. Usually for uh, reservoir scale, we go for 80% or more or 85% or more. If we can get this type of uh, value between brackets would be uh, would be acceptable. Mm -hmm. and, and I don't want to take much of your time, but one last question. So waves uh, in terms of wave energy and make transportation. Yes. Uh, we have waves, but what about tides? Do we still yes. not 
your tiles. Yes, yes, you can model tides. Now there's a there's a there's a tile toggle that you can uh, tick into your Dionysos model. Of course, remember, and I will always say it, um, you have to be careful that um, you, you're, the process that you're modeling a tide is a process which is occurring maybe daily, or you can track it. Um, so you have to understand the upscaling of this. Yeah. And you have to be very careful on what you're picking up in your model. A forward stratigraphic model, even a GPM model, uh, these are models which are picking up annual or millennial time scales. Yeah. <laughs> so you have to be very careful on that because a lot of people in the industry will come and say, oh, I have this small event here, a small sandy event, which has been generated by a tide uh, occurring on day X. No, you have to be this every time you are upscaling. And this is why I was answering the first question, depend on your upscaling. Um, for example, in Dionysos, when you model turbidite, you model a package of turbidite. When you okay. model in GPM, a turbidite by year, and you upscale it to a thousand year, this can be very tricky and very misleading because mm, yeah. turbidite doesn't necessarily occur every year or every week. Or So you have to be very careful on, <laughs> on why are you using these types of models. Okay, thanks. Exactly. I think Thank we have quite a few questions. So I think Mumtaz um, Shah was the next uh, with a question. Mumtaz, you want to ask your question or you want me to read it? All right, so I think I'll, I'll read it. So he, he thanks you for the presentation, Nicola. He wants to know how reliable those numerical modelings are in complex tectonic regime, for instance, in fold and truss belt with multiple truss, truss sheets. And you know how do you overcome this complexity? Okay, so uh, this is a very this is a very good question. Uh, um, Dionysos flow or the forward stratigraphic model usually model at the time of the position. So we use um, uh, subsidence maps to try to adjust as much as possible the the structural changes that you see in your system. Now, what we are also able to integrate is faulting. Um, I see Montaz. Uh, I see Montaz's point. When you have a lot of uh, alloctone snaps, this can become very, very complex. So, um, so um, in a in a in a let's say moderately tectonized area, I would go for it without any problem by integrating subsidence and by integrating faulting. But whenever you have overthrusts, this will become very, very complicated. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Nicolas. So next is Pete, Pete Burgess. I think he had a comment on Setsim, but also a question. Pete, you want to ask your question? Maybe Pete has left. Yeah. Uh, okay, so Pete's comment on Setsim was that it was never open source. No, it's not an open source. So that's the first thing. Uh, <clears throat> but Pete says, interesting talk, Nicola, thank you. Do you think Dionysus ever exhibits emergent behavior when modeling carbonates? So in other words, does it ever do anything that is usually beyond what is directly specified by the input parameter, something that might have the potential to evolve our understanding or provide some real predictive power? I think, it, I think it's a challenge. <laughs> yes, no, of course, definitely, definitely. Um, I think, I think, to answer to Pete's to answer to Pete's question, I think the 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 interaction of parameters by automated multi simulation this can help us understand things that usually we don't think about or or um, or uh, external behaviors that we would not uh, already think about uh, by using a single model. I agree with Pete. Uh, for me, I a, a single forward stratigraphic model will generate usually the input, the input parameter. This is a de relatively deterministic model. So you input the parameter and you usually should generate some logical behavior. But when you integrate uh, automated multi simulations, here I think this is the power to try to test and understand how far can we go with interaction of parameters. So I don't know, Pete, if you're hearing us on, on, on this and I, your, your feedback will definitely be something which is uh, very valuable. But I think if we use Cougar Flow and I'm sure that we need to push it even more um, and with the time to come and now it's becoming uh, much better uh, automated and also with multiple CPU runs we can go much quicker. But I think the automated simulation and the integration of Kuga flow and Dionysus flow here, yes, we might learn a lot on parameter behavior and uh, and how will they impact uh, on, on, you know, results that we might not necessarily think about. Mm -hmm. Uh, I, I appreciate that. You you um, you definitely gain a lot by running lots of models and analyzing, you know, collectively the results. But you know, in lots of other stratigraphic forward models, we also see um, 
the interaction of processes in the model that are not specified directly by the input parameters as such. And that's really what I mean by emergent behavior. And they, for example, generate autogenic effects, which you know, are arguably emergent behavior of the model. That's often where the real predictive power lies because it's not something that's specified directly by the input parameters. Yes, yes. Right? yes. So, yeah. so um, I'm, I'm, you know, we know this about the strata itself, that the old boring nonsense about sea level curve controlling everything, you know, mm -hmm. we're way beyond that now, right? So, yeah. so yeah. there's a lot of interesting research going on into what the autogenic signal is, how it interacts with those external forcing mechanisms. Yeah. But how much of that do you observe in Dionysus? Well, I mean, from from my side, as uh, my main work, if you want, on um, on Dionysus was was more focusing to answering questions which are not necessarily related to more, you know, going more into um, into the behavior, the, the scientific, you know, question, the time of having for scientific questioning on that. But um, well, I, no, you know, yeah, but it, it is a question of reservoir heterogeneity yeah, as yes, well, yes, yes. Because, because a lot of reservoir heterogeneity will arise from autogenic as much as it arises from uh, allergenic processes, right? Yeah. So I, mean, I think it's, you know, it's more generally important than just nerdy science experiments. But yes, de no, definitely, definitely, definitely you would be generating autogenic, uh, autogenic responses, definitely. But um, for me, from, from, wh from where I see it, is that even if I'm generating autogenic responses, um, it will be quite difficult to assess, and that's why I went directly to the, um, the multi-realization processes. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm having a lot of difficulties understand if I'm just generating one forest stratigraphic mm -hmm. model by itself, um, how am I generating this autogenic effect? Is this autogenic effect uh, co caused by an interaction of one parameter or two input parameter and, uh, a, per and, and a parameter which is not necessarily integrated in, into the inputs themselves? Yeah. And this is very, I don't know from your side, Pete, how do you see it, but from my side, I would fully focus more on multi-simulations to try to see the behavior of the different parameters and how they are influencing my model. Mm -hmm. uh, and maybe by then trying to understand if we have any autogenic effect locally in, in the model. Mm -hmm. But if I'm, if I'm just modeling, uh, let's say if I'm just modeling uh, on a basin scale or even uh, uh, at a reservoir scale, uh, okay, I might have a, an autogenic effect caused, but understanding the the, um, the impact of the generation of this autogenic effect for me is very difficult for the moment. Mm. I I know that you've tested many many models back in back in the time, and maybe now also testing many models, but um, I would be looking more to understand how these autogenic effects are are getting out because I'm always challenged by the industry to say, okay, you're generating an effect that you don't understand actually. Uh, how can you explain it? How well, can you, mean, yeah. you? You're right. You need multiple models, but multiple models may only be two, right? You may need a base case that doesn't have yes. effect operating and then yes. a comparative yes. case that does. And you can look at the difference between yes. them, learn a lot from doing that. So, yes. so I mean, I think you're right. It probably takes more than just one model, but it may not take many models. Yeah, yeah. The, I, I agree with you. I agree with you on this point. But um, transmitting this, if you want, I'm I'm more into a position where uh, I'm I'm challenged quite actually on the plausibility of of one of the two models that I propose. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm proposing two models, I will always be challenging on the fact that okay, you have two models, and uh, so you have 50 50 percent chance of uh, which one being the correct one, yeah. you know, and uh, and which one being the more representative one. I, I think you've touched on something really important there. We have a really serious scientific problem in yes. geology that we're yes. obsessed about one single answer and one single yeah. control. Yes. And, it, you know, it's a bit better, isn't it, in reservoir modeling where people have realized for a long time that that's not a sensible approach. But we still tend to go back to just one explanation. Of yes. The mm -hmm. level or it's this or it's that. I agree with you. Yeah, I just, agree with you. And it so often isn't, is it? It's so often a mixture yeah. of different things operating. And, you know, it's a shame in a way because the modeling really does let us unravel that. If you have an open mind about what the causes might be, you can explore. Yeah. But in a way, uh, if I can jump in, Nicola, those uh, uncertainty maps that you show, they act like an error bar on the model. Yeah. Finally, yeah. we can represent, you know, models with error bar and so yes. geological interpretation yeah. with error bars. And I think that's a powerful 
um, way to think, because I like model as a way to think about my regional geology or my you know, field scale geology. So, so and, that, if, and if you want, Cedric, also, and, and, and Pete, for me to overcome, if you want, this, um, this discussion about which model is correct and which model is not correct, um, the, the use of multi the, the use of multi simulation is allowing us to generate at some point what we call a facies probability map or facies okay. probability cube. And I think this was the main advance that um, uh, I and my team have done in the past five years is that we are now able to get out of the singularity of model mm -hmm. and try to say, okay, we have hundreds of models. They might have also autogenic impact, uh, local autogenic impacting on, on them. We are gathering them between brackets on, on these hundreds of models. Maybe we were not able to explain them completely, but at least we are picking them up into our models. We are re-injecting our models into a reservoir model where you have, as Pete said, the, calib the fully calibrated models on, on the wells and using multi-point statistics or using uh, variograms uh, to try to populate in a more, let's say, sensible way Mm. Uh, the facies evolution, so that we can get out of this um, single model understanding and try to open the door to, you know, to things that we don't necessarily understand by our input parameters themselves. Yeah, uh, it's a very challenging um, question to answer, definitely. And Pete, I, I'm sure you know, <laughs> you know how how challenging it is. But um, at least I'm going to give you an answer on the sensibility of my input parameters, and maybe by understanding the sensitivity of my interaction of my input parameters, uh, this I would be confident on on, on answering, but yeah. um, it would be a bit much difficult to um, to highlight uh, some more very local autogenic processes. Mm. So we, we sorry, Pete, sorry Pete, we still have a few questions and I know people have things to do. So if you don't mind, we'll move to the next question, but you're welcome to stay after the questions and we can have an open discussion. But I, I'd like to finish with the questions that are on the, uh, on the chat so I'll, I'll read them so it'll go a little faster but um, when it's your question just feel free to intervene as well so Thomas van der Leuven asks uh, whether in your experience uh, with diagenetic uh, diagenetic model on which scale do these di diagenetic process occur and how would you tackle the scale gap between the positional and diagenetic processes yeah yeah so this is a very well. This is another presentation on its own side. But just to, yeah. to answer you, to answer you quite quickly, uh, the latest models that we have done, at least for diagenesis, um, in Dionysus we went to a thousand years time scale. Uh, in Dionysus, what what we uh, what we look for is primary diagenesis. So uh, the primary diagenesis or the depositional diagenesis, we use what we do what we call the qualitative mapping of them. Uh, so I try to use many maps generated out of the Dionysus model from uh, sedimentation rate to exposure timing and um, and try to look at the tendency of diagenesis and try to compare the diagenetic features that we see on our well data or on our seismic data as cars and, uh, for example, voggy porosity dissolution or cementation, and then compare them with the stratigraphic evolution of the system and also with the behavior of the of the model with regards to the generated properties. Mm -hmm. Of course, um, uh, we have to remember very well that uh, in, in the time scales that we are looking at, we're looking at thousand years time steps and sometimes hundreds of thousand years time steps. So I would always look for, even if I'm looking at primary diagenesis, I would look for a tendency or let's say a qualitative, um, a qualitative assessment of primary diagenesis. For the secondary diagenesis, this will be much more complicated. Dionysus doesn't calculate or doesn't um, map secondary diagenesis. What we usually do, we uh, try to generate a risk on the primary diagenesis and then we also use faulting and um, uh, and some work done on different types of wells on diagenesis. And we try to predict, I would say empirically, uh, where um, or generate some small equation to say, okay, if I'm close to a fault and I have this type of uh, lithology, so it's an, it's an inverted it's an inverted process that we use. It's not a direct calculation of a secondary diagenesis. Mm -hmm. So uh, we, uh, we use uh, turnarounds or turnarounds for secondary diagenesis. Hopefully, uh, once, well, once we have um, much more in information um, or much more ca integrated calculations in the future, we'll be able to, to discuss secondary diagenesis. But yeah. to tackle this, we integrate for secondary diagenesis faults, we integrate uh, diagenetic studies on wells and, and seismic data, we integrate the primary facies cubes that we have, we inject all of this into a basin model also to try to understand the heating, uh, how is heating changing through time, and through that we can uh, generate what we call qualitative mapping of secondary diagenesis. This is very still qualitative, huh? it's not a quantitative approach. So we have to be careful on that. All right, thanks. Uh, Tomai, if you have more questions, let us know. 
Otherwise, if that answers the question, we have another question on Diogenes. It says, you can see... Uh, yes, Diogenes, of course, yeah. would be... Yes, definitely, definitely. So, uh, it's Yannick Santer, who says, thanks a lot, Nicolas. Um, is early Diogenes' influence taken into account in Dionysus, please? So, you kind of or partially answer that. Specifically, he wants to know if climate is taken into account. Yes, yes. Uh, like humid or arid. Um, yes. Yeah, if it influences... They, they are taken into account. They are taken into account through curves. So you can add ocean property curves and also climatic or temperature curves and salinity curves that you can uh, integrate, yeah. Yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and that was actually the last question. So I just want to thank Nicola again for um, a really a great presentation. And thank you everybody for uh, participating. If you want to present yourself to the this, this Carbonate seminars, let me know. If you want to know of, you know, later seminars that will take place that could be of interest to, to you, just the best is just to follow me on LinkedIn because I will post those on LinkedIn and so you'll you'll see whether or not you're interested to to join them and we'll have the same system where you register for it and you're added to the to the conference. So what we'll do now, we'll just have a, an open discussion. So anybody who has questions or point of discussion, uh, feel free to to uh, intervene. Those of you who don't, feel free to go on and do your you know go go back to your normal lives. <laughs> And, um, and for those in my research group, please stay around. Once the open discussion is over, we'll have a quick uh, group meeting. So uh, thank you, everybody. And thanks again, Nicola. Thank you very much, all. Thanks, Cedric. Oh, yeah. I'm asked if, the, if it's possible to share the recorded version of Nicola's presentation. I forgot to mention I'm recording it. The answer is maybe. I have to see how it works. I have to see what the, uh, the regulations at Imperial College are. But if it is possible, Yes, Nicola has agreed to it being recorded, and, and I think you'd be happy, Nicola, for it to be shared, correct? Yes. If you have any other questions, don't hesitate. I know this is a very, very long uh, subject to discuss, and there's a lot of matters, but don't hesitate to get back to us. Uh, give us your feedback also. Yeah. Oh, and Tom is uh, thanking you for your answer, and he says that your answer to his question was insightful. Um, he's he's looking forward to the secondary Diogenes simulator. Yeah, yeah. I'll send him on that. I'm looking forward to that too. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> I think a lot of people <laughs> working in companies are looking at that. Huh? So <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it's fair to say a lot of us are working on you know similar topics. So so with you, in fact, Nicola and, and uh, Mahmoud, um, we we have a project looking specifically at seeing how much diagenesis we can squeeze out of those models. Yes. 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 Yeah, so Pete, if you still had something you wanted to discuss, now is a good time. Or maybe he's left now. Yeah. yeah Pete seems to have left, I think. Yeah, yeah got something. Oh. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's Yannick. Uh, coming back to my question, uh, the first part was on early diagenesis. Yes. Uh, so uh, it was more on how uh, is, is this early diagenesis uh, influence the the diffusion equation. I mean, if you're cemented, or if you create bridges, or this kind of thing, is it does it have an influence, or do you have a corrected parameter to put? Very, very, uh, very good point. Uh, okay, so thank you. I'll I'll, I'll try to um, I'll try to answer this in a very diplomatic way. Okay, <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the Dionysos model, uh, you can um, you can generate uh, brechiation. So you can um, you can say at some point I want to generate a brescia out of uh, out of out of my model. So it will calculate for you brechiation. Now um, unfortunately brechiation, cementation caused by diagenesis uh, are secondary processes uh, to the Dionysus model itself. So usually everything related to, uh, to the diagenesis is a post processing approach that we use. So you will not be able to uh, affect, if you want, cementation and brechiation caused directly by diagenesis on your diffusion equation itself. Okay, so this is a, this is a post-processing aspect. That's why I was saying it's a post-processing. So we calculate a grid and then on top of this grid, we try to combine parameters to try to understand the qualitative plausibility of primary diagenesis. But this is a very, very good question, and uh, and DDA is, is doing a lot of work on this, mainly for carbonate cementation, because if you look at your diffusion equation, your diffusion equation in terms of gravity or whatever wave, um, usually 
is a particle or is a particle oriented gravity diffusion coefficient. There is a particle grain size, but doesn't take into account the cementation. And this is what DJ is currently doing. He's looking at how is my carbonate being cemented, and how will this affect my gravity driven deposits. So at the moment, I can say no. Surely say no. You can. Uh, understand in a post-processing way where are the zones that might be influenced by diagenesis. But in the near future, so DJ is working now with the student on this, we'll be integrating a much more oriented diffusion equation uh, related to cementation or related to uh, brachiation in, um, in Dionysus flow. But this is a very extremely important question. Yeah. But yeah. Nicola, in theory, if you wanted to um, do something like this now with the current version, there would be a roundabout way to do it, which is the sediment yeah. transformation. So you could yeah. transform your loose sediment into a sediment with a lesser degree of diffusion, but it's not a very clean way to do it, right? The, the only problem I'm the only problem I have is the timing at which your uh, diagenesis kicks in. Yeah. If your diagenesis is kicking in directly at the deposition, I'm fine with it. You can do it. But if your diagenesis is kicking in 300,000 years later, uh, your, your 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 mod is already passed your, yeah. uh, your your timing so you will not be able to rediffuse again yeah true. so yeah yeah very true thank you for that oh. I, I worked a bit on that with the a long time ago yes yes <laughs> <laughs> i was wondering what new new thing uh, happening in then so okay thank you i can understand it's, it's not an easy no thing. no this is a complex thing. thank you yeah. You're adding complexity. You're adding unknowns. It's, of course, it's, I mean, uh, by by just doing a simple model. That's why I'm saying it depends on what you need to model. And this was my first uh, answer. Yeah. It I, doesn't matter if you use uh, fuzzy rules or uh, or geostatistical models. What's the question that you want to answer? Yeah. Uh, a photostatigraphic model using Dionysos can answer you at a reservoir scale. Of course, no problem. But if your reservoir scale, uh, the 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 question that you're willing to answer is not answerable using a diffusion equation, well, you have to go to other equations. So that's not better or not better. It's just why why do you want to apply it and where do you want to apply it? Yeah. No, I agree. Okay, uh, Thomas had a, another question. Thomas van der Leeuwen, do you wanna do you want to um, speak your question or shall I just read it? Give yeah, it a, sure. No. I can also. Okay. Uh, yeah. Help. Uh, no, what I, I, I mean, in my experience, I want uh, the development or the manual calibration of uh, a reference model for sensitivity analysis then later is still the very time time consuming process. Uh, yeah. And I was wondering if what are your thoughts on yeah. how this can be improved uh, in the future? Do you think that, for example, machine learning, uh, yeah. we hear so much about it, Excellent. could help in this? Or, or how uh, this actually, the, for, this is a very good question. In 2015, your comment I would be like, yes, Tom, you're right. <laughs> but because uh, we, if you want, in 2015, we developed, we initiated development of this. But uh, in the current, and now, uh, now uh, the automated calibration, uh, all of this is uh, is very quick. It's much quicker than you think. What what uh, what we have been implementing in the 2020 version and 2021 version of uh, Dionysus flow and Cougar flow is first, first of all, multi-CPUs. So you're calculating very quickly your Dionysos model. So you're going up to 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 simulations very quickly. What the model is doing at the same time is that it's looking also very quickly at the well data and it's comparing your models or the different models to your reference case model or to your uh, calibrated models and will give you directly a percent of calibration. So there's kind of AI in this. There's kind of, uh, uh, as, you, as you said, Thomas, uh, there, there's kind of AI and machine learning in this. Um, and Cougar Flow, we use response surface methodology. So th there is a lot of... Uh, uh, geostatistics and uh, um, and uh, and how to say I, I don't want to call it machine learning but already in implemented geostatistics in it which will give you a quite fast response from the multi simulator so mm -hmm. now um, I don't know if you're using uh, if you're using uh, Cougar flow but now um, the calculation the, the automatic calculation and the quantitative calculation is very quick on maps and on wells okay, you can directly thanks. get an answer out of that yeah but at first, it was very, very, very time consuming. I can tell you, we used to spend days and days just to change one format, and uh, it was it was a hell. Yeah, I'm going to start working again now yeah. with Dionysus, so I, yeah. I will see uh, what uh, what it. Has Dionysus and Cougar, the link yeah. uh, will be uh, will be available for you guys. But I think it's fair to say that the reference model still is the one that will take you the most time. But it's not necessarily the it's not necessarily yeah. the package's fault. It's sometimes because your conceptual model is flawed, 
So you start with a conceptual model that just doesn't work. And I think this is you know where you can see, okay, well, this is actually the wrong way to think about the problem. So so it, it's it's a combination of finding the right modeling parameters, but also refining your thinking about the, the, the geology. And, and yet, this, experience, it's always the first model that takes the most time. And at this point, Cedric, also we've been challenged by many people is that now that you have Kuga, why do you do the manual reference case? Yeah. You don't need it. You just put minimum yeah. maximum values and run hundreds of simulation and you get a good calibration. Yeah. For me, this, this goes against forward modeling. Forward modeling, for, in, in my opinion, is understanding what are the input parameters and understanding really your conceptual model. This is why I always push people to go to a manual conceptual model so that they understand really every parameter, how is the impact on their models themselves. Okay, of course, maybe sometimes you don't have a lot of time. You go for something quick and then you use Kuga to calibrate quickly. This is fine, but um, going through inverse modeling very quickly, you will lose all the understanding of your sequence stratigraphy. You yeah. will not be able to understand the influence personally, I mean, like physically understand the, the influence of, uh, of, uh, of a change in the static sea level or, or sedimentation rate. So um, um, it's, it's, it's important not to fall in the trap of saying, I will give AI or I will give automatic uh, multi-simulations a big weights from the start. Mm. I, I will but, give a big weight on a manual calibration, understanding your geological model, and then we run multi-simulations. Yeah, I agree, because a calibrated model doesn't mean that it's a true model to the reality. I mean, I've seen, you know, in, in the years doing this with students and, you know, I've seen some models that calibrate very well based on input parameters that are physically impossible. Yes. So, so you always have to be very cautious. I, I agree with you, Nicola. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Um, any other um, questions or comments for, for Nicola? Okay, well, if that's not the case, Nicola, thank you so much. For Thanks a lot. That was a, a great presentation. Always nice uh, to see you. Um, and I guess now we're just going to have like a quick meeting with my group. So we'll, so those of you in the group, just stay around. Those of you not in the group are welcome to stay around for the boring <laughs> the boring day to day, you know, <laughs> what's happening in the lab type of uh, discussion. But otherwise, thanks for coming. And um, I guess I'll see you uh, at, at a real conference someday when we're all allowed to do that, or maybe at another virtual conference, uh, or even in this forum uh, in the future. So, so thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you, Cedric. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Stay safe. Bye. All right, so I am trying to uh, stop the recording, which um, is actually not easy to do. Does anyone, anyone know how to stop the recording? You're all muted, by the way, so you might want to unmute yourselves and switch on no, your I, video. I yeah, yeah. Uh, anybody knows how to stop recording?